Hey folks, Brian Buchanan here from the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Alberta. I'm a intensive care physician at the University of Alberta Hospital and the director of Alberta Sono. We're going to start this talk looking at this apical four-chamber view from this roughly 65-year-old male who presented with urosepsis. He also presented with pretty severe shock and hypotension and elevated lactate. Early on in his course in the emergency department, he was given a few liters of fluid and then rapidly escalated on norepinephrine, eventually vasopressin, and started on epinephrine. Now, for those who have a little more experience, perhaps you've noticed something already that's distinct about this apical four-chamber view. For those who are, are less familiar with this physiology, we're going to take a deep dive into this. And really, the focus is on dynamic obstruction. And really, the key is in the word dynamic. This is an often unrecognized form of shock and really takes, takes careful consideration and echocardiography to really see if this physiology is present. And often when I ask the residents, what's the most likely condition where this occurs, often I hear it's associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or stalk anterior motion. But this is probably a little more complicated than that alone. And really, whenever a patient has severe hypovolemia with or without regional hyperkinesia, and with or without inotropes, this can lead to hemodynamic compromise. And really what we see is a confluence of conditions that can produce this physiology in probably any patient. Things like reduced preload, secondary hypovolemia, reduced afterload, especially in septic shock or just vasoplegia alone, tachycardia where we see reduced diastolic filling, and LV hyperkinesia, secondary to inotropes or dibutamine infusions, or even just regular physiology, such as that is seen in tachycardia cardiomyopathy. We're going to explore some fairly advanced Doppler physiology here. And if you're less familiar with color Doppler or spectral Doppler, I would encourage you to view both of these talks and tutorials in advance of this tutorial. Suffice to say that in unexplained hypotension, investigation for obstructive cardiac disease should really be a core part of your investigation. We're going to break it down here by your basic approach, advanced approach, and by the hemodynamic management, really where the rubber hits the road. So in step one, Let's talk about identifying the nidus of obstruction. So back to that echo you saw earlier, the apical four-chamber view, the distinctive findings that are here show that there is obviously a pretty bulky septum here, especially the basal portion, which gives some concern that perhaps this is causing some degree of obstruction of the outflow tract. But also even more insidious is that the mitral valve structurally is not normal. You can see rather than the, the cusps coming together in the midline during systole, they're actually being pulled towards the LVOT. In the personal long axis view, we can see here that, again, this fairly bulky uh, basal and mid septum, we all see that there's very little area for blood to escape during systole out of that outflow tract. When we add color Doppler, we see this very distinct profile. We see there's flow acceleration to the outflow tract but also this eccentric MR jet, which is kind of directed posterior laterally. And um, when I've talked about this in the past with some of my colleagues, uh, we came up with this, with this idea of a, a reverse flux capacitor. This flux capacitor is uh, shown in uh, Back to the Future, but if you flip it around, it kind of gives this kind of similar, you know, upside down Y appearance of what we see here. And this color Doppler signal is what often cues me that there's probably a, a degree of dynamic obstruction. On this uh, metasophageal long axis by transophageal echo here, we can really see that that anterior leaflet's being pulled right in during systole and probably causing a degree of obstruction. On the right here, this image is just flipped. And so we see the left atrium here, the left ventricle there, and the outflow tract. And you can see that that valve is being pulled right in. So this idea is systolic anterior motion. This is that valve really moving anteriorly and being pulled into the outflow tract and actually in itself causing a degree of obstruction. And this happens often, we see references that, that cite the Venturi effect of being sucked in by uh, a high degree of force. But in fact, the systolic anterior motion happens very early in systole, and even when the velocities of the outflow tract are actually relatively normal. And so it's probably more than just Venturi effect, and it's probably more of just uh, the configuration of the ventricle and a drop in preload. In fact, there's also, while there's anterior motion of the valve, there can also be anterior motion of the chordae, something called chordal SAM. That's usually less uh, of an obstructive physiology problem, but still um, can be on the differential 
um, for, for uh, systolic anterior motion in general. We also see this phenomenon called mid-systolic closure of the aortic valve cusps. And this is because the pressure is not sustained during systole. And so the valve itself actually closes and then reopens all during systole. This can be tracked on M mode as well. You see this valve fluttering uh, during systole where it's effectively uh, the pressure gradient's reducing with, and that's unable to keep the valve open. But you know, SAM is not the only problem to cause obstruction. There are other kinds of obstruction, like mid cavitary gradients. This patient who uh, has uh, end stage renal disease and a very thick left ventricle um, with LVH. And so this patient actually had a extremely high gradient in the cavity itself, something called uh, mid cavitary obstruction. And this can occur by itself. It can also occur in conjunction with systolic anterior motion. So it can be hard to separate uh, two different elements of obstruction. Um, you can also have obstruction that's below the aortic valve, something called the subaortic membrane. So it's important just to realize that there are multiple ways you can obstruct the ventricle. And it's not always as simple as just looking for uh, systolic anterior motion. There's many anatomical risk factors that have been identified in leading to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, including hokum, hypertension, or aortic stenosis with you know, a thick ventricle, a myocardial infarct where that basal uh, LV has some hyperkinesis to counteract the drop in function more distally. Um, it can be seen with aortic valve replacement or repair. As I mentioned, Takotsubo's where the basal segment may, may become, um, uh, may increase in its contractility. A sigmoid septum, where you get this big kind of knuckle at the base of the septum, which can respond to inotropes. A steep aortic root angle. This can often be seen in the elderly, where that knuckle forms the base septum. There's also a number of other causes, too, just focusing perhaps on the acute or chronic core pulmonality, where it's actually right ventricular dilation and physiology that causes obstruction of the LV cavity. Um, and then finally, in septic shock, which uh, can be seen with a, you know, a critical drop in systemic vascular resistance, a drop in preload, and then an escalation of uh, vasopressors or inotropes. But you know, interestingly, in, in a few different studies, in a significant number of patients, there's really no anatomical substrate identified. Kind of back to that idea that it really takes the conditions of a drop in preload, uh, a drop in SVR, an in increase in contractility uh, that can really uh, form the right conditions to, uh, to kind of career systolic anterior motion or dynamic obstruction. Let's explore the advanced approach. So um, one of the things that we talk about, the hallmark of dynamic obstruction, is this kind of lid, mid to late peaking kind of dagger shape. So this is uh, using uh, continuous wave Doppler because these are very high velocities. And we see this kind of uh, uh, concave to the left configuration where, you know, rather than having a big parabolic waveform, we, we see kind of scooped out. And this is because there's actually progressive acceleration of the blood flow as it tries to escape the ever-tightening grip of the outflow tract. And uh, this is associated um, with systolic anterior motion and uh, a phenomenon of a posteriorly directed eccentric mitral regurgitant jet. Um, because it's pulling on that valve and uh, leading to that MR. You know, as that blood's trying to escape, at some point there can be a significant pressure drop, and that can lead to the mid stalk closure of the aortic cusps. But this can all be provoked or altered by loading conditions. Here we see uh, fixed versus dynamic obstruction. So um, in the fixed uh, category, you see that there's this, again, typical parabolic waveform where the actual level of obstruction remains the same size during systole. So of course you expect that there's, there's this, again, very parabolic waveform routine acceleration. Whereas on the right with dynamic obstruction, we see that there's actually a progressive acceleration of the velocities as it tries to escape the, the ever tightening outflow tract. The major issue of course is drop in stroke volume. So how do we assess for obstruction? Well, there's obviously color Doppler cues, as I mentioned, the kind of you know, quote unquote, re re reverse flux capacitor sign. Um, but what we actually do is we use pulse wave Doppler and we, we place it from the apex to the, to the left ventricular outflow tract looking for aliasing, okay? That's aliasing on pulse wave Doppler. And that helps us understand where the obstruction is. Of course, it can't tell you the degree of obstruction um, because of its limited velocity, 
But what we're looking for is the, the peak of that velocity. But that should start ideally at the apex of the LV and kind of walk your way down looking at the spectral waveform as you approach the aortic valve. So here we can see, for example, um, uh, that the velocity that of the blood trying to escape the left ventricle through the upflow tract is too fast for this pulse wave Doppler. And what we're seeing here is aliasing on spectral Doppler. So we see it actually coming, um, going from baseline down and kind of repeating itself um, over the uh, upper frame. And on the right here, we can see that there's still aliasing as you go towards the, the, the aortic valve itself. So this, uh, I just wanna give an example here of spectral aliasing to help you understand. Um, so for example, the baseline here is positioned low and obviously that blood flow as it's escaping is going pretty, pretty fast. And so we can't see the bottom part. And so what happens is the aliasing leads to production of the waveform on the upper part of the baseline. And we can see here, for example, when we have aliasing above the baseline, how it looks um, when you can't capture the entire waveform above the baseline, it's produced below the screen or below the baseline. Pulse wave Doppler helps to actually localize the exact area of obstruction. And so when you find the area with pulse wave Doppler and you see aliasing, you should just have to go beyond the obstruction where you should, you should see a drop in that velocity as the blood flow normalizes. Whereas again, the CW will just show the peak gradient, um, whereas the pulse wave Doppler helps you understand really where that is. So we use continuous wave Doppler to actually measure that max velocity. Once we understand the obstruction um, and where it is, whether it's SAM, whether it's in the, cavi in the cavity itself, we use CW to, um, to quantify the degree of obstruction. We use this by the modified Bernoulli equation, the four velocity squared. So for example, in this case, we have a velocity of uh, roughly 5.05 meters per second, producing a peak gradient of 102 millimeters of mercury. But of course, given that it's CW, it's range ambiguous. So we have to be very clear that it, we're actually picking up the, the site of obstruction um, that's accurate. So if that's at the level of the mitral valve with SAM or at the LV cavity itself, um, of course, if you have a mid-cavitary gradient but have, have aortic stenosis, then you're, you're going to really mix signals. So you have to be pretty meticulous here to make sure that you have identified the obstruction. Importantly, doing a VTI is not accurate in obstruction. And so I would use a lot of caution in trying to trace this to produce a stroke volume. There can be mixing of the signals in dynamic obstruction versus much regurgitation. Of course, we, we know with uh, systolic anterior motion, there can be a, a quite a significant uh, posterior lateral jet. And on apical five chamber view, when you place that CW, you can actually mix signals of the outflow tract with the MR itself. And so it's important to realize the, um, the appearance of dynamic obstruction versus a much regurgitant jet, which can have a very fast velocity. So on the left here, we can see more MR and it kind of starts right at the onset of systole, whereas uh, as you go more rightwards, we see the evidence of the actual um, alpha track signal itself with that dagger shape as the blood's trying to escape. And that obstruction, of course, is dynamic. It can be reversed fairly rapidly. Things like fluid bolus, reduction in contractility, ways to kind of increase the cavity size uh, and reduce the, the obstruction on that outflow tract. And so our efforts are often directed towards um, those measures. This itself just shows some classical discussions around, you know, how to induce a gradient. For example, with Valsalva, where we see a drop in uh, preload and see that uh, dynamic obstruction really happen, for example. And again, the issue is what we see is this extension of the systolic ejection phase. There is a decrease in ejection volume, but also this, there's this risk of significant MR, which can even be severe. And this in itself can reduce the cardiac output. As we can see here, there's that highly centric jet, uh, again, directed posterior laterally. And we can see that the actual jet signal itself may in fact be relatively reduced by the coanda effect, okay, which is that it's a wall hugging jet, which can uh, reduce some of that um, volume we see of the, of the color signal in the left atrium. Here's the personal lung axis. We can see again, there's that posteriorly directed jet, um, which here it's, it's obviously quite generous. And this patient here actually did have a severe MR with their dynamic obstruction.
And the reason why that happens is we see the absence or distortion of mitral leaflet coaptation during systole. So as that um, apparatus gets pulled away, the valve just can't coapt. Um, and this can lead to eccentric regurgitation into the actual left pulmonary veins itself as well. So that's going through the basic approach, the advanced approach. Well, let's talk about hemodynamics. For, so from a hemodynamic standpoint, the things that really help, things like max, maximizing the preload, um, so IV fluid boluses, perhaps under pressure, um, to really get that fluid in there and expand that left ventricle and expand the outflow tract. Really avoiding nitrates and diuretics that can kind of have the opposite problem of reducing the cavity volume. You want to increase afterload and reduce LV contraction. And so that, you know, often requires a switch to say from a, a mixed dose or a mixed uh, inotrope vasopressor like norepinephrine to maybe a pure uh, vasopressor like phenylephrine, for example, that can uh, increase the SVR while increasing some of the, decreasing some of the contractility, which causes that outflow tract issue. The next thing is really slowing the heart rate down to improve diastolic filling. So you'll see some uh, references suggest to, to try uh, IV esmolol to really reduce the heart rate and improve diastolic filling that expands the cavity and reduces the chance that you'll have dynamic obstruction. But also, if the problem itself is a, has, has, has arisen from an acute coronary syndrome, like for example, a distal LAD lesion where the mid and anterior wall is, is uh, hypoarachnetic and the basal septum is actually hypercontractile to counteract that, then that can also be um, lead to other consequences. And so you may actually want to talk to your colleagues in cardiology about getting, um, a, for example, a, a PCI, for example, or even thrombolysis if this is all, all arisen from an acute STEMI. Intratic balloon pumps, inotropes may worsen the systolic anterior motion. And I think that's obvious why with an increase in afterload or increase in contractility. So that's it, dynamic obstruction. We talked about clinical cues, things like uh, evidence on 2D, um, on M mode, and also on color Doppler and spectral Doppler. Um, we talked a lot about the use of pulse wave to help localize the lesion, but also measure the peak gradient. And uh, I would suggest just don't be fooled um, by the presence of multiple gradients. So if there is a mid cavitary gradient, you may also want to consider coincident SAM or even coincident aortic stenosis. So just be, be aware that it can be very complicated and really requires, uh, may require close consultation with your colleagues in cardiology and, and echo. And we talked a bit about how to really augment the hemodynamics to improve um, that forward flow, reduce regurgitation, uh, reduce the dynamic obstruction in, in an effort to kind of normalize physiology. I wanna thank you for listening to this talk. Bye for now.